Makes you feel like you got authority. We may have a plunger somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to revisit one of my older diagrams of my intersection of a horizontal line and a vertical line. Uh, we're going to revisit it, if you can look at it, already with some different uses for it. It just so happens that the diagram fits more or less the physiology of Homo sapien. If you look at the round circles being the brain, and this more or less representing an upper portion, metaphysical, metaphorically the cerebral cortex, and then this just the rest of the nervous system, diagrammed again somewhat allegorically as the spine itself. And consider this the, the vertical mind, and that the horizontal mind. And if you'll go down, we'll read it so that people in video can get it. The vertical mind is primary and it is the essential physical world. The horizontal mind is the secondary mental one. The horizontal mind talks, thinks, and is driven by external matters. And the vertical mind is silent, spontaneous, and runs in response to internal concerns. All of this, of course, being relative. The horizontal mind has few instances of imperative responses. It is mostly off-duty, sort of in a casual mode. The vertical mind is responsible for the actual survival of the organism of, the, of man and is always on the job. Where the two minds meet is where the sensation of I is produced. Look at it as a conjunction, a mingling of the primary energies and the secondary energies. And to be fully human, you must develop a horizontal mind. As we start talking about it, I know it can sound as though it is in some way the lesser mind or in some way, especially people interested in this, that it is the very thing against which you're struggling. But you would never be sitting here. You would never have been fully been fully a human had you not developed the horizontal mind. But, ellipsis, I'll get to, I guess. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, but the point is to go anywhere beyond that. You must, as it were, begin anew to listen to the vertical mind. But to get somewhere, to ever reach an ordinary state of maturity, to ever get to the point that you could have pursued this, you must develop a fully functioning, ordinarily operative horizontal mind. But to ever go beyond that, you can't just keep developing in some way the horizontal mind. You just can't keep stuffing it with whatever you have stuffed it with previously to get it going. You eventually, to get past that, the description almost works, is that you have to begin anew listening to the vertical mind. The vertical mind holds your vital individual energies. The horizontal one, your secondary collective ones, your civilized energies, the very things that makes you an acceptable part of ordinary functioning humanity. The horizontal mind feels itself to be a part of an ever-changing flow of time, which if you recall, I have in the past even used that one line it still fits the overall diagram as what appears to be, to most people, the line of time. Over here, spatially, for the sake of the diagram, you can see over here the past. And right here, what people assume to be the present, it's where you feel you are right now, it's where you feel you're conscious. And then over here is the future. But the vertical mind lives free from such mental concepts that it really feels itself to be no particular where in time. It just is there. We'll get that in a second. Gotta feel authoritative with a stick. 
All right. <laughs> Slap your little wrist. Hold your palm out. Uh, I assume we got good shots of all of them. The horizontal mind talks, thinks, and is driven by external matters. It's obvious it talks, and by thinks it also does this. And the more specific description of think is that as far as humans ordinarily are concerned, it plots, it analyzes. It is the only thing that can plan for the future. Whether the plans mean much, whether they're well founded, we're not going into, but it is the only thing that plans for the future. The vertical mind does not plan for the future. The vertical mind directs the organism when it's hungry to eat. Eat until you're full, in the same way as a dog or anything else, you'd walk away from it. Uh, the vertical mind does not think of tomorrow. It has no conception of tomorrow. It has no concern over, not only, t of course I mean tomorrow in a figurative sense, of any aspect of time. The thinking, the plotting of the horizontal mind is at the heart, from one way of looking at it, at the heart of the grand illusion. Because as long as you're plotting, it supports the illusion that you're responsible for what you're doing. You're responsible for what you're thinking, I should say, as opposed to doing that it feels as though you are in total responsible in some way for your life or else you could not plan. That is part of the sleight of hand that if you try and tell the vertical, the horizontal mind that it is of little importance, that it at best, other than a few instances, <laughs> it has few instances of imperative responses by God. Well, that's what I've been through before pointing out it's only, it is only times of imminent threat that you're suddenly afraid of a noise you hear in the house or you almost you lose partial control of your car going around a curve. It is only then that the horizontal mind, you could say, is brought or is involved with imperative responsibilities. It being quite simple that it is now supposed to join in with the heart with the uh, vertical mind to protect the organism the entire being of the individual involved but they are few and far between nowadays the more civilized you are the less instances that you ever have and that the rest of the time uh, off duty is simply daydreaming the better you get at realizing what's going on uh, as you know ordinary people want to specified daydreams as a discrete somewhat anomalous area of their mental activity that if the word the term daydream is brought up most people take it to be at least partially pejorative and they would say that yes or admit that they engage in some of it but if you tried to point out to them or if you said gave them the claim that 99% of all their activities in the horizontal mind were daydreams. They would deny it. And in one sense at that moment they're a little bit better off than daydreams and by daydreams I simply mean that there is the same way that as we all know there is some sort of energy that keeps people alive. Uh, it's been called all sorts of things from God to spirit and etc. But there is obviously one thing there is an energy that keeps humans alive. And when it's gone, you be dead. And there's nothing you can do about it. They can track down parts of it as being chemical, and part of it electri electrical. But there is an energy that no one can define. Anyone who says they can is an idiot. They're a fool or a liar or an idiot. All three. There is simply that energy. There is, and you can see this, it is not a fallacious and it's not a wasteful description on my part that you can see that there are what amounts to two energies running the energy that runs the vertical mind which without any doubt 
not just my say so, but is essential. It is primary and is essential because without it you die. The horizontal, there's an energy that runs the horizontal mind that's in addition to that. It simply is an offshoot of that, but it is in addition to that because you can have the vertical mind operating without the horizontal. You can be in a coma. You can be in a coma and live 50 years. The vital energy in the vertical mind of course, you all know I'm using mind in a very wide sense. But in the vertical mind, that energy, as long as you're alive, is always running. Again, no one knows its source. That's what the whole idea of God and vital energies and uh, spirit and etc. There is an energy running the horizontal mind. Even though it's an offshoot and therefore its source is unknown, it is more agreeable to a ad hoc tracing. That being that if you look at the external, well, first look at your own thoughts running, the daydreams. They're always running having to do with external circumstance. 99% of the time. If that's not enough to classify as always, then I'll be a stickler for you sticklers. But notice what it does is think about circumstance. That seems to strike a lot of people as strange. A lot of people when they first hear that one did not. But if you think about it, it's true. Relatively speaking. So what you have then is an apparent source, even though you can't identify where you came from. No one knows what is driving life. It's just life. So you cannot identify you're an idiot. An absolute you're just a fool. Anyone who knows anything will not try and identify the source of that. This source, relatively speaking to that, comparable, almost seems identifiable. Well, ordinary people would say it's here's where it would go with them. Uh, ordinary psychologically inclined or just ordinarily educated people, they would... Or they could, if I pointed out, they, they could see this as the struggle again or the dichotomy between nature and nurture or between uh, heredity and environment, roughly. And so they could say, well, this kind of energy that runs you is genetic. It is hereditary is all you're saying. And they could see, what, of course, most of them would still want to say, well, it's somewhere like from God or some super systemic force. But at any rate, the horizontal they would uh, be agreeable to see is source identifiable because they would say that the mind, as you all know, everyone ordinarily believes this, that the mind is an absolute development of circumstance, of the environment. That if you left a child alone, he would never learn to speak, he would never learn to uh, think. And so you could say that what appears to be each person's personality, which is, as I said, the... Uh, combination between these two energies of where they meet, what appears to be a person's individual self, which is all a part, it's all based upon the horizontal. You cannot do without the horizontal or you have no personality. You can be alive with a vertical mind, but no personality. That is, no sense of I, no sense of consciousness. You could be in, a, I guess, a walking around coma, but that's what it would amount to, that you would still be ambulatory, but you would be in a coma. So ordinary people could see that this apparently is source identifiable, that it is the environment, that your personality, for good or ill, your mind itself, your ordinary intelligence, your ordinary mental life has been produced uh, postnatally, that your parents taught you to be a German Catholic or an Irish Protestant or a Syrian Muslim. And that that's how you grew up, and that you had a fifth grade education, or you have a master's degree. That you're well read, or you're just barely literate. So that appears to have a source. The, the purpose of me pointing this out in such detail, or trying to, is that the horizontal talks, thinks, and you might put slice plans, which is really part of the great way in which it deceives itself. And is driven by external matters. That were it not for what appears to be external sources, the horizontal mind would go limp. 
It would go blank. All you got to do is ask yourself, just look. If a person is so inclined to take some inventory of what goes on in their mind, just looking at it, and then see if this is not true, that if you extracted all external conditions, past, future, if you extracted that from what goes on in your mind, what would be going on in your mind? I submit to you, and you can check it out, very, very little. Very little. Whereas, you have a vertical mind that is always in operation, but it is, compared to the horizontal, it is silent. Absolutely. It cannot speak to you. Uh, I assume most of you know what I mean by now, but for anyone who doesn't, the closest, this should tell you, anybody who has any doubt, this is the closest that the vertical mind can speak to you. It'd been neat, I just thought, if I had gone a couple of days without food and take the mic and put it on my stomach, if I could make it go... <laughs> The sound, you know, when you're hungry, or even when you've overeaten. That is about the closest that the vertical mind can speak to you, which is, you understand, fairly ridiculous. But it is silent. The vertical mind simply does not speak. It cannot be taught to speak. It is silent. It also has, see, silent and talks, but thinks and plans, it is spontaneous. It has no sense of planning what it does. Uh, again, speaking relatively. Because now everything is commingled and it's increasingly difficult for a person to operate by the vertical mind solely. Under ordinary conditions, it's damn near impossible. But it's very difficult to operate spontaneously. That uh, the more civilized you are, again, that is not an insult, but the more civilized you are, the less ability you have to act spontaneously the less ability the vertical mind has to speak to you directly. It can be to varying degrees, but it in some way is going to be intermingled with the horizontal mind, or in some sense, if you'd like to say it this way, it's going to be filtered. But uh, that's normally thought of as being some sort of censorship, which uh, it's understandable why people describe it that way, that they, the whole idea of being civilized is that you do censor your more feral, uncivilized instincts, that you do not act in a barbaric, animalistic manner, that it is filtered through your civilized upbringing, your education, your sense of morality, etc. But it is really a process of mingling. It's not just censoring. That's a very, it's not an ill-founded description, but it is, I suggest to you consider, it's more of a mingling. It's more a sense that once you have got a, a sensation of I, then you have the mingling. I and mean, it's not a matter of will you, that is produced. You can only have a sense of I once they are mingled, once you have both. If you never developed the horizontal energy, the horizontal mind, you will never have a personality. You will never have any sensation of you. As far as, every, as, far as you're concerned, you don't exist, except you don't even know that you don't exist. But the vertical mind is silent and is spontaneous, and it runs, I repeat, nowadays everything is intermingled to some degree, but in a pure sense, in a relative sense for the sake of my comparative descriptions, its responses is always to internal concerns. And internal concerns representing survival instincts. Internal concerns have nothing to do with external circumstance. You staying alive has nothing to do, it should be obvious even though it seems impossible to be true, but it's obvious when you hear it verbally, that staying alive has nothing to do with your reputation. Living to see another day has nothing to do with how much money you have in the bank. It has nothing to do with whether you're well liked. Being well liked will not keep you alive. The vertical energies are only responsive. That's their only real job. Whether they get drawn into other matters is another question, which they do. You know, it gets to be to extreme degrees is where you find such things as they call psychosomatic illnesses, stresses. But under ordinary conditions, with an ordinary person, they get by. The balance life is, is just that way. An ordinary person, that's exactly what the definition says. They're an ordinary person, or that's what I usually call them, ordinary, sane. That's exactly what they are. 
is that they are balanced. However it is that life wants it. I know that men believe that's by their definition that psychiatry decides or the collective wisdom of society or psychologists or the judicial system, the courts decide what is sane, what is ordinary. That's all after the fact. There is a balance. If you notice what is sane in some parts of the world is not exactly what's sane in other parts of the world, even today. It's going to be more and more a one-color, homogeneous uh, definition of sane and ordinary, but it's still not. It is certainly still not today because there are places on this planet that is parts of life's body, life's human body, to where the balance in, that, in the local area is not exactly the same it is here. But them saying that it's caused that their religion teaches them a different sense of morality or reality than somebody else's religion, that's all after the fact. You've got to remember that anything that goes on in the horizontal mind is always after the fact. There is no such thing as a preeminent. There is no such thing as a, any energy, any activity in the horizontal mind that predates the vertical mind. They're all after the fact. They're all aftermarket add-ons. They're all superfluous. That's why I call them secondary. Nowadays, I repeat, you have to have such a mind to be fully human. And that, that's not just today, that's always been true, but you cannot not have a horizontal mind, no matter what fault you may find with it. You must have one to ever get up to ordinary speed. But its responses, what appears to be its interest, as much fun as they may be, they are secondary. And that should be obvious by now. That uh, they may be great fun to you, but they are not survival uh, necessary. Where the two minds meet is where the sensation of eye is produced. Without the sensation of eye, there is nobody in you to think. And conversely, if you cannot think, and what we ordinarily call think occurs right there. It occurs, so to speak, although they may not cross exactly, but it occurs more or less where the cerebral cortex crosses the brain stem. And I just had the for the sake of convenience, condense that little space because where they do meet is where man thinks. You cannot think if you just have the horizontal mind. You cannot think if, if your cerebral cortex was had an IQ of very high three numbers and in some way you could destroy the vertical mind, which you couldn't, but if you could, uh, you wouldn't have anything. You understand you can't. Again, that's one of the, it used to be one of the dreams of science fiction movies, is a brain in a jar. There are many so-called mystics long before science fiction movies, long before movies thousands of years ago, and still most religion has touches of it, is the idea, operating on this base, from this view, it, they usually look at it as being the body instead of a vertical mind, the body, the flesh, that if man was free of flesh, and I don't mean just fundamentalist religious people. There are many people who believe themselves educated, hip, would-be mystics that look upon the body as being a great encumbrance. They curse the body. Fool on the body. If it weren't for my body and all the ways it drags me down, keeps me distracted, here I am mentally or spiritually, they may say, the kind of people that look upon it as being the flesh and the spirit, but they're still talking about the vertical and the horizontal mind. But they say, well, it's the flesh with all of its crude taste, you know, sex, hunger, and then they start throwing in things like greed and etc. but it's all sex and hunger. But they say, were it not for that, if I was just my pure spirit, ooh, boy, how awake I would be. I would have been enlightened years ago. And if you also notice, that's everyone's idea. If they've never tasted of what enlightenment is, and conversely, that's what all the religions idea, more or less, of a paradise after life. There's no more flesh, no more vertical mind, only horizontal mind. It's not possible. But notice the basis of it. And everyone's got a piece of it. Everyone is at time curse the body. I would hope that you're up to the point that the only time you might curse the body now is you know, when you're passing gallstones or having hemorrhoids or a coughing fit. In other words, illness. That's because the rest of the time there's nothing to curse. And the idea that you're going to have some spirituality or some consciousness sands the body, you couldn't be more foolish than that. 
where they meet or the, is where you think. And without that, you would not be human. And that should be obvious again. You simply would not be human. You would look like a human, but you would be in a coma. As I said, as far as I know, no one's ever actually been in a coma in a fully ambulatory manner that they can get out and do everything and still be in a coma. But that's what you would be. If you do not think, then there is nowhere in you to produce this sensation of I, that if you never develop a horizontal mind, there is no sensation of I. Also, though, without a sensation of I, there is nothing in you to think, which is the real, the rest of this you could junk. If you could hear that, if you could hear it in the sense that it slapped you in the face, there is nothing to experience being human. Well, let me change think then. You cannot be human without the sensation of I, without having a horizontal mind to merge to cross the vertical. You could not be human without a sensation of I, dash. But without a sensation of I, there would be nowhere to be human. Because if you didn't have an I, you wouldn't be human. We might look at you. Somebody might say, well, he looks like he's human or she looks like she's human. But you would not be human. You would physically resemble a human, but you would not be human. Without, internally, this sensation of I. But I repeat, this thing is empty. All it is is a continuing flow of sensations. And all it takes is somebody to try to see it. There is no such thing. Again, the spatial it fits, if you can follow this. In a sense, this vertical is always there. You can look at it as being a fountain. It's just a flow of energy right up the spine, and that's it. And it's always in one spot. For all intents and purposes, it does not change. You eat, you sleep, you screw, you defecate, you die. None of that changes. If, if it changes, you're sick. If you try to change it, you're doubly sick. It's simply with an ordinary person, there it is, you're born with it. It's just simply, it's like you're born and the power company turns on your power. You're an idiot, you don't fool with that. You need it to live. So that is permanent. But this, again, spatially it fits, it seems to be representative of movement. That just spatially, we're just accustomed to it. If you're looking at a picture or a diagram such as this, something vertically, like a tree, something planted in the ground, it's there. But then up here, like the branches of a tree, something running out, it all fits. It just seems, well, it's movement. It's the past going through me. It's different, all sorts of uh, things I learn. Because here, you don't learn anything new. You can think you do. No, you can't even think that. You'd have to be an idiot again. You don't, as you get older, learn to eat better. Regardless of those making money off of books, you don't learn to fuck better. I mean, I know it gets to be a hobby and people say, oh, you're getting better and you know, I bought this new book. But, you know, sex is sex. Eating's eating. Sleeping's sleeping. And so there, you're born and everything is operational and you can't really improve it. You can't really affect it. The only way you can affect it, if you try, is in a negative manner. But up here... In this world of the mind, it seems like it is nothing but change. It is nothing but a field of great opportunity. Which is, if you notice also why, it must be, if you're an ordinary person, that it, or it is continually seeking new stimulation. You know, here you eat. Now we all know, I've been through this, uh, food for instance. Eating is a primary activity. But, but it can get up here when it merges and it can become dining. It becomes a hobby. It's not either right or wrong, but it is simply an elaboration, an unnecessarily elaboration of eating, of dining becoming a big social event, or of you continually trying new recipes, trying new kinds of food. Nothing wrong, but that is not eating. It is not the primary operation of eating. The be vertical is now horizontal. It... The horizontal seeks continual new stimulation. That is, once, when it gets just to eating, no one finds fault 
I'm sure you can follow. No one finds fault with eating. As I said, you can't improve on eating. If you're hungry, you actually come in from a hard day's work and you are hungry. Physically hungry. The vital vertical energies say eat. You will reach in the icebox, assuming you only keep food that you like and food that you find agreeable. You will reach in the icebox. You could have a blindfold on. And whatever your hand gets, you're going to eat. That's eating. And the kinds of foods, whatever foods that you would find would keep you alive, they do not change. There's, you never get tired of them. But once they're mingled up here and it becomes dining, you have to continually look to continue to get dining pleasure. In that secondary activity, you have to continually find your recipes. Same thing with other mental stimulation. As you know, you've got to keep seeing new, new movies. You can't go to one movie and go, well, by God, that's like eating a big dinner and it'll last me all day. Or one daydream. Or glancing at TV once. It's a continual process because this has no vital, essential purpose. It is all entertainment. It is all secondary. It is all non-essential, relatively speaking. And therefore... The only thing that seems to give any pleasure is for it to be a continuing process of new stimulations in this horizontal mind. So back to my change of description, then that one, if you followed it. You cannot be human without having those two minds. You can't be human even if you're not a great diner, if you're not a great moviegoer, if you're not even participating greatly now in horizontal events, you were at one time. Your mind has to be up to the point that you understand it fully, that you're not a critic, that you don't say, well, anybody that goes to movies are idiots, or people that think that dining is some kind of hobby are crazy. Eat yourself a sandwich and shut up. That's no basis for anything. Once you understand what it is, you're not a critic of it. You may not be participating in it greatly anymore. But at one time you were. At one time you were developed enough to understand it. Is what I, of course, mean. I don't know how much you were involved in it. Maybe a lot, maybe not a lot. But to ever be human, you had to understand it. To ever be human, at one time, you had the potential to be a galloping gourmet, a great movie-goer. You could have been Iskell and Siebert or Siebert and Bumbass, or whoever it is. You could have been every ordinary, smart-ass, sophisticated, pretentious human on this planet. If you, if you couldn't have been then uh, you're into this too early because everyone should have already been the biggest smart-ass, pretentious, know-nothing, blow-hard. I mean, pick out the most uh, ridiculous, sophisticated person you have ever seen on the screen or in person or on TV, the kind of person that you look at and almost, almost everybody, even a Hollywood director or a New York attorney, if they're on the same stage with this person, even... Even they are almost chagrined. Like, oh, God, are you making an all-star, world-class ass of yourself and don't realize it, which, of course, is what makes you a world-class ass. <laughs> You're into this too early if you cannot realize that you have been their equal. You've got to. In a sense, you have got to. Anybody who ever succeeds at this, you have had to be as dumb, stupid, pretentious as anybody on this planet. Truthfully, it's not any form of pseudo-humility. You have got to have sunk to all the depths. You have got to have... That sounds too ordinary. You have got to have all the abilities, all the capacities that any other human horizontal mind had. In other words, there cannot be anything all that foreign to you. So, for you to be human, you have to have an I. There has to be a sensation of I within you. But, think about it the other way. There can be no sensation of I within you without a horizontal mind. And a couple of nights ago, I didn't write it down, but I'll add one more time. Once you see this, there is nothing permanent there in the same sense that th there is with a vertical mind. It is truly, once you can see it, it is a hollow place. It is a vacuum. It is a possibility that must be activated. But for all intents and purposes, this might as well be like a tunnel an empty tunnel running from the time you're born to the time you die, that you don't know where it's going. But it's like this tunnel, and in there exists the sensation of you, but it's only because of the traffic. There is no actual you in there, it's thought. It's the pumping of the horizontal mind. 
It's just the blood and electricity of the cerebral cortex. This is uh, another retelling, if you can catch it, of what I was just talking about. That it is the vertical mind that is the source of. That's where you're vital, just in the true sense. You're vital, your life support energies are, but it's also where your individual energies are. Now even though up here in the, vertical, in the horizontal mind is where we all seem to be individuals, and it's not true. If there is any individuality, well, if you think it's true, of course it's true. I can't prove it's not true. If you think, ordinary people, of course, must think. That's part of what the horizontal mind does, that I am a unique individual, for good or ill, but usually for good. It's not so, once you see it. Well, it's not so, and it's not not so. It's irrelevant. Uh, being held by the feeling that your horizontal mind is your source of individuality is an absolute hobble. You'll never get past that. You'll never reach any other state of consciousness if you believe that, which is the reality behind all the ancient ideas, religiously and metaphysically, about the need for humility. There's just no word for it, and that's the best they can come up with. Humility is not really it. Humility is a childish version of what an awakened man would see as irrelevant. That's what it amounts to. Up here, that's where everyone seems to be individual. But it's not so, if you ever see it. Your individual energies, whatever they are, which is actually just your genetic disposition. You, know, you can call it unique if you want to. You're partly your mother, partly your father, and your grandfather and grandmother. And so, if you want to play mathematics, you could say that you're unique. Well, I guess you are unique. But you are unique vertically, horizontally, Again, I repeat, think about it right quick, it should hit you. I can't, if I say that you're not an individual there, that you're not unique, that mind absolutely rejects that. I understand that. And it can't be proven. It absolutely, I wouldn't even try. You either see it or you don't. And it's not that it's not unique, but it's not that it's not 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 unique. It's irrelevant. It is truly, all right, let me go ahead and be as more serious, at least as I wrote it, the vertical holds your vital individual energies, whatever they are. The vital energies we know, that is the self, the uh, survival instincts. But it also holds what will amounts to any individual energies. The horizontal mind is only the place of secondary collective energies. Maybe it's easier to see than I'm imagining it is for, ordinary, you know, for people listening to this. Because if you look at it as collectively, go back to ordinary people's view, which will fit, is that that mind apparently is postnatally produced. That it is the output, in some way, of other people. Because everyone believes, at the ordinary uh, level of thought, they believed everything they know they got from somebody else, or from some other source, from books, somewhere. And so that mind, I guess ordinary people would agree to that, that that mind seems... I could probably get them to go for more or less, seems to be produced by externals. Again, if you left a kid just by himself and threw him out in the woods, you know, he would never develop much of a mind, if any. He's got to have other humans. And so they would probably go along with that, not realizing the implications. But the horizontal mind holds and is run by secondary collective energies. It is the civilized mind. It, its only basis, its source, is the collective minds of men, collective horizontal minds. Its purpose is to fit into the horizontal ordinary world. Its master is the collective world. That's what, of course, being civilized is, being able to fit in, that what you th say you know fits in with what everybody around you says they know, and your immediate locale. Whatever you consider to be your community, your nation, your race, your linguistic group, whatever it is, if you're ordinary, then your sense of reality, your sense of being a human, being one individual among many, is still more or less acceptable by everyone else. And so the energies contained in this, the energies and purposes for which this mind is operating is not individual. Again, it's something that is just simple and plain as hell. But people do not stumble on it. The mind, that mind cannot see it. You cannot tell the horizontal mind that its purpose has nothing to do with the individual in which it is operating. 
In other words, you can't go up to any man, any ordinary man or woman, and say, your mind is not serving you. The purpose of what you call your mind is not individual to you. It's not unique to you, but it is not serving you individual. That's not its purpose. They go, what? And right, suddenly they think about it, and as always, it seems to turn right there to that point that seems to be the soul of their mind or their soul. And they go, no, that's not true. <laughs> because it's so private. They're thinking that's not true, and they think, you don't know that. Only I know that I thought that's not true. I'm in here by myself. It's me and my eye. We got all these secret plans. We, we've got all kinds of ideas and notions that you don't know about, talking to the person that just accused them of not having, or that their mind did not serve them individually. At any rate, it does not serve individual needs. Uh, again, this is one of the things, uh, in a more perfect world, I would think, under the, just seeing that, would wake a man up. To realize that this thing that seems to be, if you don't know, if you don't investigate it, if you cannot get free from it to see it, that this thing that seems to be you, that seems to have all your unique ideas, has your singular interest, the thing that makes you you, does not serve you. It is serving. Do you understand what I mean by serving? Maybe I should reach for a synonym. Serving's it. It is not serving you. If you're ordinary, it's not hurting you, certainly, but it is not serving you. It is serving the collective. It is serving life. Uh, if any of you can, I hate to say much more about it verbally, but it's in a sense another description of being conscious in a new way is what I'm saying is to return anew to not listening to this once you realize that it has nothing to do with me individually. Nothing which seems just ridiculous on the surface. Because you think, well, there's anything that's unique to me, it's this horizontal mind. Because you can say, well, this vertical mind's not unique. Everybody's got a stomach. Everybody's got sex organs. Everybody's got a liver. Everybody's got lungs. Everybody's got a brain. Everybody's got a brain stem. And so they'd think, well, this is not any source of individuality. I'm just a body like everybody else. Maybe a little fatter, a little leaner, a little taller, but that's not my individuality. As you know, all civilized people they believe that the sense of a person's individuality is internal. That it's not a man's. They'll say this in a, the heat of a philosophical moment, that even ordinary people will admit, well, a, a man is not truly what he is simply because of the car he drives or his clothes or how he looks. A real man, what a man is, is his spirit. Is they usually say, but what they're saying is it's internal. If there's anything to a man, it's not the way you look what you've got, it's internal. They'll say that. This, they feel though, if it even gets that point, they still would think, and if I told them otherwise, they still feel. This mind feels, this is what makes me unique because this does not make me unique. This I have in common with everybody else. Everybody got the same guts, the same basic structure. So there's no individuality there. No, 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 no. If there's any individuality, if I'm in any way unique, it has got to be up here. Because of the combination of what my taste in music, my taste in clothes, my taste in uh, you know, food, my taste in movies. Just the, the, the whole potpourri, the whole collection of my numerous individual interests come together to make me the unique individual that I am bullshit. The only place that you have any individuality being served and you don't know it because it doesn't speak. It does not normally express itself. The closest it expresses itself is people who, are you ready for this, want to wake up. Which is why it's so hard to talk about. Did I say so hard to talk about? Well, hush my mouth. It is only here that there is any individual energies flowing. But they cannot talk. They're not intended to talk. And you might look at it this way. May I put it to you this way? They are not pushy. Only up here does energy get pushy. This, the energies flowing in the vertical mind. Maybe this will give a hint. 
the energies, if I tried to describe them, rather than do so individually or give uh, some descriptions, the energies in each person's vertical mind would fit the definitions of a properly religious person in every religion in the world. In other words, here would be a Jew, if you wanted to be a Jew. Here would be a Christian. Here would be a Muslim. The point being, this has no greed, no envy. If I got to go through all the deadly sins, no gluttony. This cannot sin, in the, the full sense of the word. This cannot go astray. If it goes astray, you're a dead man. Under ordinary conditions, this cannot sin. There is the true individual. There would be a true, if you know what I'm pointing at, a true Christian or Jew. Here would be an awakened man. But somewhere this side of that. Here is where people are truly individual, and here is where the energies are not, have no connection to that, the external world. Relatively speaking. Of course, we're all fish and water, and we're all humans in reality. But this is not driven by external concerns. I repeat again, it should be, I know it sounds funny because you think, well, I'm living in an external environment. But comparable to this, when you compare the two, this runs off of purely internal concerns. That is when your stomach is hungry, you eat. Now, if you're operating from the horizontal mind, it is possible that you're watching advertising you know, they keep showing pizzas, or they show sexy women eating pizzas. You get all kinds of confusing energies getting mingled up here, and you might. Then suddenly somebody sitting next to you watching the TV commercial, you go, you know what? Pizza wouldn't be bad. And you weren't hungry, but you'll go, okay, I'm in for it. It's not either right or wrong, but you understand that was not vital, it was not pure, and it was not individual. If you're hungry, it comes from your stomach. You can be made to eat. You can be an enticed to eat, such as that commercial. That's the best example I could think of. But that was from external conditions. If you get horny, it happens internally. But that's what pornography is. You can be not horny. You can be not thinking about sex and just be flipping through a magazine and suddenly there's a picture of a nude man or woman, whatever gets you, and you look and you keep looking, maybe it's two or three, whatever it takes, and suddenly you think, you know, I could do with some. You know, if she was here right now, I'd, you know, I'd nail her. But you weren't horny. It came from external. Again, it's not a matter of right or wrong. But it's only in here that there are anything resembling pure individual energies. And energies you can read as interest also. And yet, if you notice this, if, if I made the point, if you got it, it appears to be exactly the opposite. It is here that people believe their uniqueness exists. It is here that they believe that a man or woman can be, can change themselves into something spectacular, into something singular. No matter what you do up here, you cannot get away from it. The energies that run this, the, the horizontal mind, are secondary, but they're collective they will not serve you individually. It's just not possible. And you either you either discover it or you don't. That is why I've said that there is no information, there is no knowledge, there's nothing that any any horizontal mind ever thought this of any help to do this. I know it seems like it is, but it's all an illusion. Because once you realize that, then you're free from that. And so even if there was anything there at the time that you thought was interesting, it's no longer interesting or it's no longer informative. It's no longer necessary. Because it does not serve you individually. Uh, the horizontal mind, everybody, I get, well, you should be aware of this. There's a purpose for it, not just theoretically. But that does feel itself to be. You don't sit around and analyze it, but again, if you look at your own thoughts, here's the basis of it. That they are, you just have to see it. It is, It is intractably tied to a sensation of time. This is in the middle of what appears to be this flow, this ever-changing flow, but now this time, rather than just circumstances in general, external time. Look at your, what ordinary people call daydreams. Look at your thought processes. 
if it is simple daydreams of replaying things, then replaying simply is self-evident. It's the past. Or it's worrying about plans for the future. That kind of thinking and planning. Uh, the mind ordinarily uh, has no real sense of the present unless something, as I said, an immediate apparent threat or if there is an immediate vital need such as hunger, sex, illness. But up here, there is almost no sensation of a present. I just threw it in so that it seems to make sense. That's where it should be. And that is where the old kind of trick of saying you can make yourself a bit more conscious right this second just by going, I am conscious right this second. And try and stop that flow. Try and stop thought, but try and stop whatever's going on in the head and just hold a sensation. Just try and hold a nonverbal, if possible, but at least a sensation. All right, I'm conscious right now, just right this second, and nothing's going on. Other than that, are an accidental external threat to the organism to bring attention to heal. Other than that, there really is no, all you've got to do is look. There really is no ordinary sensation of the present. Everybody pays lip service. And you can't really talk about time if you say, well, there's a line of time, then there's the past, and there's the future. You know, people are going to say, where's the present? So you go, all right, the present. And that is where it seems to be. That if there is any presence, if there is any contemporaneous time, it would have to be where the two meet. But if you are living simply here, this thing is always flowing, and there never is a place where they actually cross of which you will be aware. It's always this. Well, I'll put this the more you live in this, the more it's that. I mean, that's obvious by its own definition, by my own description. If you, the main place in which you are conscious, the main place in which you reside, your primary source of orientation is this horizontal mind, it always moves. That's the nature of it. This does not move. If that moved, again, I assume you're getting this, if this began to move, if this was unreliable, you know, you'd get up one morning and your lungs would be trying to uh, digest food and your stomach would be trying to breathe. This is dependable. This never changes. This is nothing but change because there is nothing there. It is a potential. It is a emptiness. It is a hole. It is a tunnel. It is a zero under ordinary conditions. Very seldom is it called on to actually fulfill any sort of essential duty. The rest of the time, in the imperative response, the rest of, it's just off duty. It's just hanging about. It's daydreaming. Whereas the vertical mind is enough people, I assume of you have been through, you've had these experiences, at least minor experiences of the great realization. And another fine description, at least one, or one attribute, is there is no sensation of time. Until you're free of it, you don't know. You really don't know how much a sensation there seems to be of time, how much of the tenseness of the body, how much of the pressures that seem to be going on in people's lives is tied to time. Time doesn't cause it. Nothing causes anything. But to be, to be free of this, to be conscious and not, on, and not be tied to that, it's as though some sort of unseen wind that's been driving you. It's like you don't know it, but there's a wind at your back that's continually pushing you. And it's like you're trying to fight against it. Sometimes you try to stand upright or walk backwards or sideways. And I, it's what people ordinarily think of as time. And there's no other way to describe it. I could, I guess, go for some other allegory. But when it's gone, you suddenly realize it. And that's why I try to describe it this way. I know it sounds a bit maybe metaphysical flim-flamish, but it, it lives free from mental concepts of time. It just is. It ju you're just there. And as long as you're in that condition, as some of you, many of you know, nobody can get you excited. Nobody can pressure you. Nobody can call you up, a stranger or a friend, but a stranger couldn't call you up and say, you have five minutes to get down here to our office and you've won a million dollars, but you must be here in five minutes and it's a 30-minute drive or whatever. Or somebody, if you don't respond today, or somebody says, you've got to come help me. You've got to come over now. You've got to do so-and-so. <laughs> and it's just funny. <laughs> and I don't mean that you're laughing at people, but it's humorous. When they go, we've got to do so-and-so. And you think, no, I don't. <laughs> well, you don't think anything, but you know what I'm getting at. And she realized, no, I don't. 
But ordinarily, you're right. I'd be, to some degree, caught up, and you're going, wow, do you know what's going on? Of course, if somebody called you, and you're in that state, you know exactly what's going on, but you don't answer. You go, yeah, I know what's going on <laughs> for the first time in my life. And they'll go, no, 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 no. Do you know what's going on shortly? <laughs> and you think, yeah, the same thing goes on longly. <laughs> same thing goes on all the time, nothing. They go, no, 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 listen, hey, listen, this is important. And again, you just want to laugh. Because you know what they mean when they say important. It's all tied to time. Up here, since the whole thing is illusion, for people to say, well, it's important. There's nothing important up there. It's not vital. It is not life-sustaining. It is a secondary activity. And so to say it's important, normally, the only way, or the most basic way you prove that something is important is that it is working within a time frame. That we must take advantage of this now, or else we must get away from here now. It'll be too late. You think there's no <laughs> too late, <laughs> too early, too late. Well, we're almost out. I think next time I will go into. I was actually going to get into some of the sermon of how you might use this, but here it is. I've already given. Uh, but I was going to try to describe to you a new kind of method. It's a variation, but um, I'll do that tomorrow night. But it's. Vertical mind, horizontal mind, vertical mind, horizontal mind, vertical mind, horizontal mind, vertical mind. You could just fade out on me. Horizontal mind. Vertical mind.